you, you talk about your, you know, atheist friends, blah, 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 friends. You seem yeah. like a popular guy, got a lot of friends. Um, <laughs> what do you do when you're faced with the dilemma that says you either believe in science or you believe or have faith? What do you personally do with that? Dilemma? Great question. All right. First of all, regarding your comment, you're right. I talk about my atheist friends because I want to point out that all of my atheist friends are moral, great people. Because often people misunderstand that when I use the moral argument and say there are no moral absolutes if there is no God, they interpret me or understand me to be saying that atheists are immoral thugs. Baloney. All right, that's totally misunderstanding my point. I don't have an atheist friend who's an evil guy. All of my atheist friends are altruists, very wonderful people. All right, so I just want to, you know, that's, that's why I talk about my atheist friends. What do you do when you're faced with uh, science versus faith? You bet. Great question. Whenever I'm confronted by science versus faith in Christ, I'm a little embarrassed for the person. Why? There is absolutely no contradiction between science and faith in God, faith in Christ. Instead, if you study the growth of the majority, majority of modern science, it is within the context of a biblical worldview that says the tree is not God, the tree is not part of God. The tree is part of the creation. You've been given a rational mind, and by you examining the tree carefully, you will begin to understand the process of nature. Now, what does contradict faith in Christ is a philosophy of science that says the following. Unless you can scientifically prove it, it's not true. But that's obviously not science. All you got to do with that line of thinking that says, unless you can scientifically prove it, it's not true, is ask yourself, can I scientifically prove that unless I can scientifically prove something, it's not true? See, it's self-defeating. The whole idea that unless I can scientifically prove something, it's not true. Really? Oh, fine. Then please scientifically prove to me that unless I can scientifically prove something, it's not true. You can't do it. It's self-defeating. It totally falls apart. So what is that statement? Unless you can scientifically prove it, it's not true. It's a philosophy. And obviously, it's a very sad philosophy because it's totally incorrect. And then obviously, I try and get a little practical and say, really? You really? I mean, I, before I started out here today, a precious woman comes up and says, Cliff, I don't believe in God. I believe in science. Now, I don't mean to be chipper, but I looked her in the face and said, really? You ever going on a scientific date? Really? Is your family life based on science? Oh, come on. Science is a wonderful branch of knowledge. I love science. I appreciate science. But holy smokes, friend. If you reduce your life to a scientific equation, you're going to be a very lonely, isolated person. So that's how I begin. So if you were um, in, in my... Uh I guess people here would use the term walk. In my walk, I am often faith, faced with this simple argument, God does not exist because evolution. And so, I mean, I would say one does not contradict the other by any means. So what would you who are much better and more knowledgeable than I do with, if an atheist came up to you, right. like, pretend I'm an atheist, right, right now I'm saying, God does not exist, so I'm ignoring your seven proofs. God does not exist simply because their uh, evolution is not a theory but a fact. What do you? What would you do in that? Situation? You bet. That's okay, and it's a great follow-up because it gets right back to what I was trying to say. You've got to ask yourself, what is evolution? 
and you got to divide it into two parts. Process, origin. Just remember those two words. Process, origin. Process, origin. I am totally open to evolution as a process. But I am not open to evolution as an origin. Why? Because evolution as an origin is not science. Evolution as an origin is a philosophy of science. It's a philosophy that says, behind the process, there's no intelligent mind. We originate from chance and fate. Well, sir, that is not science. That's a philosophy of science. But I can promise you there is nothing scientific about it. So, I accept evolution as a process. In other words, is it possible that God used the process of evolution to create? Of course it is. And there's nothing in the Bible that contradicts that. Because remember, the Bible is silent about the process that God used to create. But the idea that there's no intelligent mind behind the process, which is evolution as an origin, well, obviously, I don't believe that. But that's a philosophical disagreement. Does that make any sense? Oh, absolutely. I agree. And I think it's cool to point out how, like, in Genesis, you have this creation poem that basically states there was simpler form of life. There was trees that he made. And then later on, uh, it uses the word day, but later on it says now there's animals and now there's more complex animals and then there's humans. So it's not like, you know, that in any way would contradict evolution whatsoever. Great point. And one of the things that frustrates me is when I say to people, Genesis chapter 1 does not answer the question, what process did God use to create or how long did God take to create? And wonderful people say to me, Cliff, you've compromised. Right. You've compromised Genesis. Really. The whole Bible. Yeah, exactly. Baloney. Go back and read Genesis 1. Hebrew poetry, clearly. Oh, Cliff, no, 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 no. You're just, you know being intellectually dishonest. Baloney. Get the NIV, read Genesis, look, just look at Genesis 1, the indentation. What is Hebrew poetry? Not spot, hot, shot at the end of the line. Oh, it rhymes, it's a poem. No, the Hebrews didn't do that, okay? Hebrew poetry was parallelism, parallel ideas. So what I want you guys to do who think that Genesis 1 is not poetry, you read Genesis 1 tonight, Compare day one and day four, day two and day five, day three and day six. And what you'll notice is day one is light. What's day four? The creation of sun and stars. What's day two? Separation of water from sky. What's day five? Fish and birds. Oh my goodness. I see a parallel here. What's day three? Animals and humans. No, excuse me. Land being separated from water is day three. And what's day six? Animals and humans. Oh my goodness. Look at the parallelism. Then as you read Genesis 1, notice the repetition of two phrases. God said, God said, God said. Notice then at the end of the little whatever he said, and God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. And if you can't pick up on that parallelism, come on, friend, learn to read. It's obviously parallelism the author's using. That's Hebrew poetry, which doesn't mean it's mythology, but I can promise you it is not a scientific explanation of how God created the world. Absolutely. And I would say beyond but not belittling to the poetry aspect, it's also or oral tradition. So just like we have refrains, we have choruses to help us memorize things like same thing there, every good Hebrew would have the first five books memorized. So that's a cool point. And yep. then so I would go on to, in the science realm, where is the line between taking, and we can be specific to Genesis just because like that's 90% of history, if you look at like, you know, year-wise of the Bible almost, you can say, maybe not 90%, but it's a good chunk of the history. Um, what, where would you draw the line between uh, interpreting uh, elements of the poem of Genesis as literal versus uh, there's a bigger story behind it. That's You bet. Point. Okay, I love to define literal. And I define literal as you better literally read everything you read. Because that's the only way you're going to interpret fairly. Now what does that mean to read literally? 
It means that if you're reading a poem, you better literally read it as a poem. If you're reading historical narrative, you better learn to read it literally as historical narrative. And if you're reading a biology textbook, you better read it literally as science. In other words, to read liter and interpret literally means you better learn to respect literary style. And if it's a play written by William Shakespeare, you better read it as a play. And if it's poetry by John Donne, you better read it as poetry. But if it's historical narrative of African history or US history or Asian history, you better read it as historical narrative. And if you're in biology class, you better read it as science text, scientific literature. Secondly, the way you interpret is not just by respecting literary style, but also by reading in context. You don't rip one line out of Othello and say, that's Shakespeare's worldview. You don't rip one line out of the Quran and say, that's what Muhammad taught. And you don't re rip one line out of the New Testament and say, oh, that's what Jesus taught. You learn to read in context, and then you interpret. So you think there's room to say Adam and Eve very well may be a literal story, but the point of it, the point of the poetry, the point of the style is to point at something bigger than there was literally one guy and one girl who procreated so much that we now have, well, till we had the Noah thing, which may or may not be literal, and then, so that sort of thing. So you'd say that, that the, in the sense that it happened exactly the way Genesis said, isn't as, as important as, you know, the reason behind the poem, the reason they wrote it in that way, the reason why every good Jew would memorize it by the age of 10 or 11 or what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, I personally believe that Adam and Eve were real historical people, but if I get to heaven and find out no they weren't, I'm not going to be blown out of the water. Because I don't think the text is overwhelmingly specific. But if I get to heaven and find out that Jesus wasn't born in Bethlehem, I'm going to be royally bummed out. <laughs> because it's clearly historical narrative that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But you're right, going back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, you know, how historical is that in light of the fact that chapter 1 is poetry? It's, it's hard. Now, I think due to other scriptures, the evidence is there was an Adam and there was an Eve. And then one last point uh, in Genesis. What, so we have this story of Noah if you take it out of context, it looks very similar to like an all-powerful king destroying everyone in his land and selecting one family to continue on. So uh, what, what would you say that the point of either Noah and uh, the historical events that happened of Noah is or the point of the story of Noah? Does that make sense, the differences? <laughs> All right. From studying language in the Bible, Often the phrase, the whole world, the whole earth, is not literally talking about North America, South America, Eurasia, Iceland, Greenland. No, it's talking about the known world. Therefore, I have to be very, very careful when the Bible says the whole world. Is it talking about literally every, the whole kibit and caboodle, or is it talking about the known world? So that's why I personally am hesitant to say Noah's flood was, was worldwide. Is it possible that that flood was a local flood? I would say, yes, it was. Is it possible that it was worldwide? Yes, it's possible. I don't know. And the reason that I don't know is because I don't think the text nails it down. But you've heard very clearly people pin me today, and I appreciate it and respect them. Go a young man said it just a, a while ago. Cliff, God executed the firstborn of the Egyptians, unmistakably, I think the text clearly says that. So we're not going to back off that. The question is, why? What's the thinking behind that? And that's what we have to then begin to work through. So when the text says something clearly, yes, I hold to the text. But if the text is vague and unclear, I don't want to add. Why? You ever hear of a guy named Galileo? Yeah. Yeah, Galileo did better science than the Aristotelian scientists, didn't he? And Galileo showed the Aristotelian scientists to be wrong. The Earth is not the center of the solar system. It is the sun. Well, because he did better science than the Aristotelian scientists, and because they were poor losers, they went running to the Catholic Church. And they said, guess what, guys? There's a heretic running around out there named Galileo. And the Catholic Church made the boneheaded decision 
to adopt an Aristotelian view of the solar system and baptize it with, oh, this is what the Bible teaches. Where does the Bible teach that the earth is the center of the solar system? Oh, well, obviously the Bible says Joshua stopped the sun. Oh, come on, man. And on Good Morning America tomorrow morning, when they talk about sunrise and sunset, you're going to call up ABC and tell them they got an antiquated view of the solar system? It's obviously a figure of speech. From where I'm standing, it looks like sun rises and sun sets. That is not a scientific description of my solar system. And so the Catholic Church made this horrible mistake of persecuting Galileo. But I love what Galileo said. Galileo never lost his faith in Christ, never lost his faith in God. And Galileo said, the Bible tells me how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Bravo, Galileo. You're right on. The Bible tells me how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Okay, cool. I, I agree with that. That's a cool point. Um, so the Hebrew word noach, I pronounce it wrong most likely, is a very similar to the Hebrew word for comfort. So when, when a Hebrew audience would either hear or memorize the story of Noah, they would associate, associate it with comfort, and that would suggest that this story to us is to be comforting. And it absolutely is in the sense that, you know, like despite people um, messing up around us, if we put our faith in God, God has a future and a plan for us. So in that regard, it's very comforting. But what do you do to the person who says, well, yeah, but he also wiped out everyone but six people, or at least in, in that land. What do you, and I know this, this concept has been asked up, but so this time I'm being specific uh, to Genesis and Noah. So like, what do you think of A, the idea of it being um, something similar to a parable or a, literal, or a literary device to make a point that, you know, if, if you put your faith in God, if you are a man of God, if you raise your family to be like God, you will have a future despite the chaos around you. So A, what do you think of it as a parable sort of thing? Or B, how do you deal with um, a God who almost instantly in the beginning, or not instantly in the beginning, but in the grand scheme of history, in the beginning just says, in essence, people are too wicked, I'm gonna wipe them out and start again through a new guy. Okay, first point is, I am very grateful that God is just. <coughs> That means that evil ultimately loses. Remember, if God doesn't exist, what you and I call evil ultimately wins. So I'm very glad that God is just and that he judges evil. I am convinced that if God does not judge evil and punish evil, that he's not good. If I'm a good father and someone kidnaps my child and messes with my child and I'm not angry, and I don't seek to do something. There's something wrong with me. So the reason that God is angry about sin is, is because sin destroys lives. It's the only right reason God is against sin, because sin destroys lives. So, at different points in history, be it the flood of Noah, be it Sodom and Gomorrah, be it God using the Israelites to judge the Canaanites, be it God using the Assyrians and the Babylonians to judge the Jews, God intervenes and chooses to judge. Now, Jesus Christ warned that the biggest judgment is going to be at the end of human history when he returns a second time. There will be a day of judgment of all of us and there will be a heaven and a hell. I'm grateful for that because that gives me hope that ultimately goodness and justice win in the end. Now, I am convinced that Noah was a real historical person. Why? because I think Genesis clearly communicates that, and then other passages like Hebrews chapter 11 clearly talks about Noah as being a tremendous man of faith. So uh, what about the, the story of the flood specifically? Do you, do you view that as historical and more than just like your opinion on it, would you view that if you did not believe it in the, as a historical story, such as the later stories in the Bible, that you would be somehow belittling God or belittling God's grand scheme or story. There are many followers of Christ who think that the flood at the time of Noah was a universal around the world flood. There are many other followers of Christ who think that it was a local flood. I don't think that either one of them are belittling God in any way. But I mean, what about it as a concept of a parable in general? As in parable the... in general? Well, if, if that's the way they read the text, I'd be fascinated to know What's the evidence that the account of Noah in Genesis is a parable? Oh, just similarly to how you can believe that Adam and Eve, that story goes beyond the literal, like, 
there's one man, one woman. Um, so like, you know, the name Adam mean, meaning dirt, the word Eve sort of meaning life. Like it almost would hint towards it being the importance of Adam and Eve not being that they were the first humans, but that it is the start of our story. So I would say that more important than uh, Noah being a story of God's God proving his wrath and his capabilities, it's a story of, like I said, if we have our faith in God, if we trust in God, God will, despite the chaos around us, continue with our story, continue with the story that he started in the garden and will continue throughout history through Jesus and through Judgment Day. So I personally view it as a parable. Now, I don't yep. disrespect you or question your intelligence or your faith at all. Right. If you or, or anyone would interpret it as a literal event, it's not that thing. But I'm just, I'm just questioning, like, do you, so to make it personal, which I know is slightly inappropriate, do you think, like, I, I should seriously reconsider? Pursue Christ, all right? And then study the scriptures. And if you think the evidence is that the Noah account in Genesis is parable, just keep on thinking it through. And if, if the evidence is it's parable, then read it as parable. And I, I, you know, I really don't get too hung up on Noah and Jonah and the other guys who went through some pretty fantastic things. So I don't think it's a major issue. You bet, man. How do you deal with doubt? How do you grow your faith? The brilliant woman Madeleine Langle once said, those who believe, they believe in God, but without passion in the heart, without anguish of mind, without uncertainty, without doubt, and even at times without despair, believe only in the idea of God, not in God himself. I like that. Almost every thinking person who I know struggles with doubt why? Because there are so many unanswered questions in this life. There are so many mysteries. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, those mysteries do not all go away. Instead, often you and I struggle with doubt. Well, how do you grow in faith? How do you overcome your doubts? We have a tremendous example of a person who did exactly this in the New Testament. His name? Peter. The Apostle Peter struggled with doubt. He wanted to grow in faith. How did he do it? Two ways. By asking hard questions and by taking risks. Jesus was walking with Peter and the other Apostles and they were near the city of Caesarea Philippi. Suddenly Jesus turned to them and asked them, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they gave some options. And then Jesus asked, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter blurted out, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus blessed Peter for that answer. A little while later in the conversation, Jesus alludes to the fact that he's going to die on a cross. Peter says, no way, I'll never let that happen to you. And Jesus looks into Peter's face and rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. So Peter had a serious case of open mouth inject foot disease. But the point is, he kept on thinking. He kept on asking questions. In Matthew chapter 18, Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Thinking that that was pretty impressive. And Jesus said, no, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And then Jesus told that magnificent parable of the unmerciful servant teaching Peter that forgiveness is never limited. Forgiveness keeps on going and going and going. Not forgiving is like eating rat poison and expecting the rats to die. Not forgiving is allowing bitterness and anger and resentment and revenge to eat you from the inside out and expecting it to hurt others. So Jesus clearly taught forgiveness, and Peter kept on asking questions and grew in his faith, and Peter was also willing to risk big time. One night Peter's in the boat with the other disciples, and suddenly they see a figure walking towards them on the water. They're scared, thinking they see a ghost, an apparition, but suddenly they hear a voice. It's me, Jesus. Peter says, if it's you, Lord, 
tell me to come out walking on the water to you. And Jesus says, come on, Peter. And Peter gets out of the boat and walks on the water to Christ. Amazing risk. Then Peter takes his eyes off of Christ, focuses on the waves, listens to the howl of the wind, is scared spitless and begins to sink, but he cries out, Jesus, save me. And Jesus reaches out, grabs Peter, and pulls him out of the water. Amazing willingness to risk. That's how you grow in faith. Not by staying comfortable, not by staying secure. If you've got a doubt, you better ask questions and you better learn to study. You better look for evidence that'll point you in one direction to grow in faith or in the other direction to grow in doubt. When you struggle with doubt, you better be willing to take risks, to trust Christ even though it's scary at times, and then to see, is that wise to trust Him even when it's scary to trust Him at times? Faith in Christ, though, is not intellectual naivete. Faith in Christ is not blind faith that simply says, I believe, I believe, I believe. No. Faith in Christ is based on evidence, historical evidence. He lived a sinless life. He taught amazing ethical teachings. He died a cruel, agonizing death on a cross. But while he hung on that cross, he prayed for his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He's been transforming lives for 2,000 years. And this Jesus Christ is reliable, for the evidence points to him being totally credible. Is it not time for you to put your faith in Christ if you've not already made that decision? Is it not time for you to ask him to forgive you for your wrongdoing, to trust in him, and to receive the gift of eternal life that he promises to all who trust in him? God bless you as you make that most important decision. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning at 9.30 at Saks Middle School in New Canaan, Connecticut. Take the Merritt Parkway to exit 37, go to the end of the ramp, take a left onto Route 124, go approximately one mile and take a right into Saks Middle School. I'd love to personally invite you to join us this Sunday, 9.30, for our worship service. Have a great day.